Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, what a great day, huh? We are so blessed. Um, we've been privileged to uh, bring to you uh, Walid Shabbat, uh, a really, really powerful speaker, but you know, really a great guy. Got to spend some time with him last night. And hey, what's not to love? He likes In N Out burgers. <laughs> We're going to stop and get a bite to eat. And he saw the In N Out sign. He's right there, right there. <laughs> so uh, he, he can't tell us where he lives, literally, for security purposes. Uh, but he did say they don't have In N Out there. <laughs> Uh, tonight, uh, he'll be back at 6 p.m., and uh, he'll be speaking on uh, prophetic uh, issues, uh, specifically uh, the Antichrist and, uh, and what we're to look for. And, and I am actually excited for you to come back and hear that. It's fresh. It's a completely different uh, approach. You'll love it. You'll be challenged. You'll stretched, and uh, hopefully all of us, hopefully a little bit stirred. Can I use the word shaken? Yeah. Uh, it's time, how many of you think it's, it's time for the church to just come awake? You know? Yeah. you know, we've gone in my lifetime from the Jesus movement where everybody was, yeah, go, go Jesus. Uh, all the way to where um, we're now the, uh, the dregs of society. You know, what's holding everything else back. Well, there are some things that need to be held back. Amen? Right. Come in here tonight uh, as well. Uh, following uh, Waleed's uh, message this morning, we're going to even a uh, full hour. Uh, following that message, we'll uh, receive a love offering for his ministry. He, he comes without any... Uh, financial request, and uh, I did buy him a burger, but, uh, <laughs> but he comes uh, just, just to share, uh, just to share the, uh, the wonderful love of Jesus with you. So, Waleed, come on. Now I'm going to put your bucket on my side. <laughs> but they, they they warned me before, you know, they said, you know, you better finish it by 11.30 because we detonate the C4 and this thing through cell phone. And now, instead of carrying a suicide belt, they carry a battery pack thing here and I've cut down tremendously. Uh, I enjoyed the In-N-Out hamburger. Thank you, Pastor. Where's it? There he is. Uh, I might be a foreigner, but I do know a good American product. I like to bust myth most of my speeches. Busting myth. They always tell me that the Bible belts in uh, Tennessee there and there and Texas and there and there. No, no, no. My experience, to be honest with you, all these years I've been speaking around this country, the Bible built Southern California. Amen. I've never seen something like Southern California. Every time it's Southern California, I said, I don't care, I'm going, because that's really where the Bible built is. I go to countries where traditional Christianity is exercised, and that's the Bible built. But in California, Southern California, especially Southern California, it's biblical Christianity is exercised, and and it's a, it's, a, it's a different place. It's a unique place. It's where the Christian revolution basically started, if you know what I mean, a few years ago. Uh, I always like to get my cues of what I'm going to talk about from the songs. I say, Almighty, please talk through the songs and tell me what do you want me to talk about today. And I love the song, How Great is Our God. And as soon as I heard the song, I looked at the words, uh, Godhead. The Godhead, three in one, Father, Spirit, Son. I don't know how much that means to some people, but to me it's everything. Why is it so much everything to me? Is because in Islam, 
Islam really is a thesis. Islam is a polemic, whether you study the Quran or the Hadith or the struggle that we're having with that religion. It's all over one statement. Father, Spirit, Son. That's it. That's it. The war is for that purpose. The Islamic world invaded Christendom and began to occupy Christian territory, killed tens of millions of Christians. Just the Turkish Ottoman Empire in their wars, a few million, over this issue of making Christians believe that God is not a triune God, that God is a Unitarian God, which is not something that the Bible did not warn us about. It's that Western Christians, by and large, don't look at what the Bible has already been warning you about. Even talking about Antichrist, you know, subject of Antichrist was pastor yesterday. In Western thinking, Antichrist is, you know, somebody who claims to be Jesus when in reality he's not the real Jesus, but he says, I'm Jesus. But the Bible says, calls him Antichrist. He is against everything Christ stands for. He's against the Son. He's against the cross. He's against the Father. He's against the Trinity. He's not going to say, I am Jesus. I am the Son of God. When in reality, he's not the real Jesus. He is Antichrist. And in his place, he wants to replace Christ to be like God. And his pride, because he is the son of perdition, the son of the father of lies. And so, in 1 John 2.22, the Bible warns us, who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is the man, Antichrist, that denies the father and the Son. And don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever forget those verses. The spirit of the Antichrist must always deny the Father and the Son. That's the sole purpose of the spirit of Antichrist, which the first believers, even the apostles, dealt with and wrote it for us in the Bible. As soon as Christendom was born, there was the war right there, trying to shut the light of God and his essence, and that's how the enemy begins by attacking the essence of who God is. And that's what the Bible warned us about with the rise of Arianism. And from that moment, Islam, you know, later on, you know, the Arian movement were exiled into Arabia, and Islam was born as a religion that is a Christian cult, if you will. Because just like Mormonism, just like Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, these are Christian cults. They're not Christian. They're Christian cults. They try to kind of masquerade as believing in the true God of the Bible, they masquerade as they believe even in the Bible, yet in reality corrupt God's word and create their own word, Book of Mormon, Quran, what have you, to deceive the sheep. And Christ told us, be as wise as a serpent and as innocent as fools. Now, I did not reach that conclusion about the Godhead, about the truth, just by living a simple life and somebody came and witnessed to me in the street, I rejected the gospel. I was an enemy of the gospel. I had my own different set of understanding who God is. In fact, we cried out, Allahu Akbar, our Allah is great. While you cry out on the other side, our God is great. In fact, it will be in the end times as such as the enemies march, as the Antichrist spirit marches against the believers they will cry out how great their God is, and we will cry out how great, how great our God is. We will stand. In fact, everybody will be marked, including the believers will be marked. It says it in the Bible. We will have the name of God in our forehead. So it's not what we have. It's not that a mark is the problem. The, mark is what, the problem is what that mark says. They will have a mark of blasphemy. They blaspheme God. They deny his essence. I grew up in the Middle East. My mother was an American, naive American Christian, went to Bible school, did not listen and heed the warning of her pastor, do not marry out of the faith. She fell in love with my father, and no, you should not marry a Muslim. Well, are you a racist pastor? No. It says in the Bible that do not be unequally yoked. 
That one simple instruction my mother did not follow, and she could write books about the results of simply not following that one simple instruction in the Bible. Yet in every church I go to, I always, this church right here, after I finish the service, somebody's going to come up to me and say, my daughter, my, my you know, married a Muslim, and they, we, we went through hell, we don't know what to do. And, you know, the problem goes on in every single church that Christian girls are falling into the trap that, oh, well, we're not racist. Why can't I marry a Muslim? Well, being unequally yoked has nothing to do with racism. A Muslim girls don't marry Christian boys. Can you name me? Anybody here heard of a Christian, uh, uh, a Muslim girl marrying a Christian boy? Raise your hand. Muslim girl. And she remained Muslim and he remained Christian. Thank you. Did she remain Muslim and he remained Christian? That's not my question, though. <laughs> See, I always have somebody raise their hands. You'll find one, and the Guinness Book of Records says there's never been found. Uh, anybody here heard of a Muslim girl who remained in her faith as a Muslim, married a Christian boy who remained in his faith as a Christian? Nobody. Anybody here heard of a, uh, a Muslim boy marrying a Christian, Jewish, you know, secular American girl who is not Muslim? Raise your hands. Muslim boy marrying non-Muslim. Raise your hands. One, keep your hands up. I want to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Why we find thirteen? Heard of this case, but Zippo in the other case. I thought Islam offered equality to women. I like to bust myth. It's a myth to say that Islam offers equality to women. My mother did not understand that. In fact, I was talking to her two days ago before I came here. She said, the moment I entered the Middle East with my husband, instantly my husband was a different man. He was not the man I married in the United States of America. All of a sudden, I'm a second-class citizen. All of a sudden, I realized the woman I got there, my passport's been taken, and welcome to the Middle East. You are married to a Muslim. Your children that you gave birth to are all Muslim. Your daughter is Muslim. She must marry a Muslim. You must live in the Middle East so your daughter can marry a Muslim. Say sayonara to your country. She realized right then. She would entered the, uh, what you call the Hotel California, you know. <laughs> you can check out any time you want, but you can never leave except in a coffin. My mother could not witness to her children. She could not express her faith to her kids. I never knew my mother was a Christian. You think about your life as a Christian. I never knew my mother was a Christian. And my mother couldn't express her views. She had to remain silent most of the time. But she would run away when my father turned the Quran on. And I never understood. Mom, why would you always run away when my dad turns the Quran on? Now I understand fully why my mother ran away. She wanted nothing to do with this. She's always believed that Islam was a satanic religion as, so, as soon as she experienced Islamic religion. And uh, her whole plight was, how can I take my three kids and escape to America? Because you might think it's easy. You just take your luggage and just get the next flight and Ben Gurion Airport and, and get, out, get the heck out of Dodge and go to the United States of America. She tried that. She had to go do paperwork. She had to prove who she was. And by the time she was doing this process, she had to remain one day in Jerusalem. The second day, the family were waiting for her at the entrance of the embassy. She was captured, sent back to the house of obedience, as Islam calls it, beaten by my father. Now the children were brainwashed to turn the mother in at any inkling of any thought, of any dream, of any sort. I, I want to go to America. So girls, especially young girls, if you think you're smart and you know more than your pastor, talk to my mother. Talk to my mother. Now her dilemma, it was, how can she convince the three snitches? How can she convince the three snitches to escape from the Middle East? 
Because you might think, you know, she can go to the embassy. The embassy can help you because there isn't a single Muslim country that is signatory to the Hague Convention. You know, the Hague Convention regarding the abduction of women and children, which came later on. Even later on, when the Hague was found, there was no Muslim country that wants to be signatory to the Hague Convention. In other words, a Muslim can take his wife and his kids, go to a Muslim country. You can kiss your family, your heritage, your constitution, your freedom, your flag, goodbye. If Islam is a peaceful religion, show me where is this freedom. But my mother was very Christian. In fact, my mother and father slept in separate rooms for most of my childhood. I never knew why mom and dad slept in separate rooms. Finally, my mother told me, she says, I was never a good, obedient Muslim wife. And in the Quran, it says, if your wife, in the Arabic, let me quote it in the Arabic, which means, if you fear their disobedience, then leave them in bed. Don't sleep with them in the same bed. Punish the woman. You know, because the woman has needs. And when the woman has needs, after a while, she'll submit and you'll give her her needs. Then she can become a more kind of a palatable, moldable wife as a good Muslim wife. And you know what I mean, you know. I don't have to explain that explicitly. But my mother used to say out of all the Islamic punishments I had to endure, that was my favorite one. I had some bad habits as a teenager. I still have that bad habit. In fact, many of you will judge me over my bad habits. I used to smoke cigarettes. I still do. And American Christians judge me on smoking more than anything. As if you only knew my previous sins, you will forgive this sin. Well, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't know how to quote the Bible. I said, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God said to burn incense in the temple. <laughs> and if you continue in the text, it says, and it was a sweet aroma to my nostrils. <laughs> well, I used to smoke. I uh, quit many years ago. Well, the difference between me and you, sir, is I am not a quitter. And I stole my mother's menthols, when you're desperate, anything goes. And I went to my room, and I huffed and puffed, and I huffed and puffed, and huffed and puffed. I kept that secret to myself. One day, apparently what happened, my mother was witnessed to by a couple missionary from Texas. In fact, I met the missionary after I became Christian. Years, 20-some years later, knocked on the door. And I thanked them for what they did, something that you need to do. When somebody saves the life of your mother and saves your life as a result of witnessing to your mother. And I uh, saw the Bible. They apparently gave her a Bible. And she was rededicated into the faith. And she was baptized in the YMCA pool in Jerusalem. And she was given a Bible. She kept the Bible secretly under the couch, under the pack of cigarettes. And I saw, you know, bad idea. Keep the pack and the Bible separate. And I went to steal my menthol, and I saw the Bible under there. And the second day, I confronted my mother. Mother, you know, snitch. I'm going to tell my father, you're a Christian. You're studying the Bible. My mother had to think like a very smart American. She said, well, uh, go ahead, tell your father about uh, me studying the Bible. And I'm going to tell him about your cigarette habit. <laughs> what cigarette habit? says, I'm your mother. I know everything you do. <laughs> so uh, we cracked the deal. <laughs> I got the cigarette, and she kept her mouth shut. Now I could go to my mother's room, since she was being punished by my father, shut the door. She could read and recline with her legs up, reading the Bible, as I smoked the cigarette. I began to ask my mother, I said, Mother, what does this book tell you? She said, it tells me everything that I need to know. Like what? She said, everything. God set the future in the past. Well, what do you mean? She 
as Isaiah says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me for telling the end from the beginning. So when you see it happen, that you know that I am God. My mother began to challenge me. I said, what do you mean the end from the beginning? No one knows the end from the beginning. She goes, my God does. I said, what about my God? She said, your God, son, is the devil. I'm going to tell my father. I said, go ahead. I'll tell him about your smoking habit. <laughs> tell me more, mother. Because as a young teenager, my whole dream was to establish a Palestinian state. All Palestinians want to divide the land, establish a Palestinian state. That was in 1976. And my mother said to me, yes, the Bible does tell us that you will have your state. But God will be angry. And God will come down to earth and judge the earth for creating such a state. I says, why? Allah is on our side. How could it be that God does not want us to have a state? She said, because God, the true God, that is Walid, he is the God of Israel. He's not the God of the Muslims. He's the God of Israel. And in Joel 3, it says very clearly, son, let me show you. For I will gather all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment there with them on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Christ will be upset. God will be upset. He will send his son to judge the nations for the mistreatment of Israel and for dividing his land. How in the world could that be? You're a liar and your Bible is a liar. My father told me the Bible has been corrupted. Yes, the Bible has been corrupted. For your prophet took verses from the Bible, borrowed apocryphal works and fairy tales and concocted a new book called the Quran, which is the corruption of, of the Bible. So yeah, if that's the way you think, the Bible has been corrupted. The corruptors who accuse the Bible of corruptions are the corruption. Everything is in reverse in your mind, but you just don't understand it. Moved on with my life, continued. Did not believe my mother. Of course, a good seed was planted. But the Americans think that everything is like in and out hamburger. They want it right now, the double cheeseburger now. My food is late. doesn't work that way. The manure had to set in, and the stench had to go till high heaven. And then the sun came up and dried the manure. And then the seed was germed and got and became and saw the sun and began to bear fruit. And the better the manure, the more the manure, the more the stench, the better the fruit. So I lived my life wanting to destroy Israel because I went to school. Because Americans think, well... It's an issue of education. If you can only teach the Palestinians a better education, maybe they will become peaceful. But even if you change the education, it doesn't matter. You still go to the mosque. The mosque is the center where you get all your spiritual food. The teachers of the Islamic studies were very clear. You have even Christian eschatology. Let me share with you some Islamic eschatology. We have eschatology too. By the time I reached high school, my teacher, Sheikh Naim Ayyad, Sheikh Naim Ayyad told us that the reason the Jews are in this land, because the idea is it's our God versus their God. How come their God is winning? We lost the battles of the Six Days War, Yom Kippur War, 48 War. There's no way we can defeat Israel. Our God is the truth. We should defeat them. Well, Allah allowed them to be gathered here so we can destroy them. Because Islam taught us this, Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تغلب طائفة من المسلمين طائفة من اليهود قيل أين يا رسول الله قال في بيت المقدس وأكنا في بيت المقدس No, I'm not speaking in tongues. No, that, no that I'm, I'm not even charismatic. 
The day of judgment, he says, shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations. And then the trees will cry out and the stones will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Come, O Muslim. Come, O servant of Allah. Come and decapitate him. What part of kill and decapitate and Jew do you not understand? And uh, I remember in the classroom, there was some questions asked from she uh, by the students to Sheikh Naim Ayyad. The kind of questions were asked, well, you said we can kill the males, but not the females. You said we can take the females as concubines. You also said that we can have children with concubines. How can you have children with a woman? How can you sleep with a woman and bear children if you are not wed to these women, if you're not married to these women? You know, there's moral questions here. Kids ask moral questions. It's a religious studies, theology. Aren't you supposed to be married, you know? There's no, you don't have to be married to a concubine in order to have children with a concubine. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, took his concubine in Saudi Arabia when he killed the tribes of Banu Quraidah, in which all the males were beheaded. All males within puberty were beheaded. Boys were 12 years old, 9, 8, 11 years old were beheaded. And all the women were, uh, you know, given to the prophet, to the apostles of the prophet. And Muhammad laid his eye on the tribe's leader's wife after killing her husband, her brother, and her father, and consummated his right in the way back to camp when they erected a tent for him to consummate his right with his concubine. Strange. One student asked, and he says, Teacher, is it consensual? He said, it doesn't have to be consensual. So I went to my father, and I began to ask questions because my father taught Islamic theology. When I went to my father, I asked the question. My father agreed with the teacher. Now, it took me many, many years later to find what we learned in Islamic eschatology somewhere in the Bible. When I began to challenge my wife, Maria, you know, you have to understand, between that and this, I planted a bomb in the bank. I came to the States. I was in Chicago. I was mentored by Jamal Saeed who was a colleague, it is said he was a colleague of Abdullah Azzam, the godfather of Al-Qaeda. In fact, you could still see him in Bridgeview, Illinois, in his mosque, raising funds. He raised funds for Hamas, he raised funds for all these terror organizations, and he's still not arrested, roaming free. And you can see in my website the kind of events they used to host, in which you see just an event like this, all over this country, in mosques. In uh, hotels, rented hotels, shut the doors, nobody could hear what they say. And they would come out, and the favorite verses from the Quran would be read to the congregation. If you meet the unbelievers, then strike off their heads. And then a report, you know, you have, you have praise reports in your church every now and then, praise reports. They bring a Hamas leader to give praise reports. It's praise reports time. He comes masked, and he will give a praise report. Who they killed, who they murdered, what Jew they found when they killed him, where they dumped the bodies, what bus they blew up, in full detail to the community. And then the youth will come out. You got youth programs? They got youth programs too. The youth will come out, and they will sing a chantation. That's a very... Common one, Gina Saf, Khodna Zaf, Khatena Lehdud. Gina Saf, we've came in unison. Khodna Zaf, we've marched against the enemy. We have penetrated your borders. They're singing to you. We have penetrated your borders. And then as soon as they walked out of the events, they were peaceful Muslims. Peaceful Muslims. You've been looking for years for these peaceful Muslims. Not understanding that Islam has taqiyya wa kitman to conceal your faith, 
to conceal your true identity. Islam says, harbor inner animosity towards the enemy and conceal your true faith. There is muruna, to be stealth, to be bendable, to be, you know, be stealth. You'll never tell the American enemy what you think. This is why one of my favorite things I do in the media is I simply do something. My job is very simple, really. You know, we say missionary, ministry. My ministry is very simple. It's like Noah's ministry. What was Noah's ministry? Uh, it's going to rain. Thank you very much. Fox News and CNN was there. Well, no, I never rained before. It's going to rain. Thank you very much. Sorry, I got to close my barge now. And everybody pointed fingers at Noah. He was a liar. It never rained before. The whole world pointed fingers at Noah. Yet Noah was right, and everybody in the globe drowned and died. One man can be right, and everybody can be wrong. It's usually the way it is. And you tell them, to no avail. I walked into the BBC when I first became Christian, I remember. Walked into the BBC. And all what I wanted when I became Christian was to get on that TV and tell the world what the truth is. I said, God, send me out. Send me out. I said, I told my wife, Maria, said, Maria, I'm going to get on that TV set. You're going to see me on the TV. I'm going to tell the Americans the truth. She said, are you crazy? I said, no, I'm not. But look at the TV. There's nothing but crazies. One more crazy won't make that much difference. <laughs> I remember walking into the BBC and began to talk about the subject. Uh, that was in England. When you are willing to do God's work, he opens the door like you won't believe. And I was sitting with three so-called stooges. And they were scholars, supposedly, and they wrote books, and they were all, you know, very educated British. Welcome to the BBC, Mr. Shubat. You know, I sat there, and I began to explain to them the problem. I said, the problem of fundamentalist Islam has nothing to do with land has nothing to do with America's occupation of Iraq or is supposedly Israel's occupation of Palestine. Three-fourths of suicide bombings exist in Muslim countries that have no occupation whatsoever. It's got nothing to do with land. It's got something to do with a salvation plan. It's a salvation message. Because in Christianity, one martyr dies. Sheds his blood. And anybody who wants to honor that shedding of their blood can now enter into paradise. That's the death of Jesus Christ. He shed his blood. He was martyred for us. In Islam, there is no assurance of that salvation. Islam denies the shedding of the blood of Jesus. Islam says that in order for you to assure your salvation, you must fight warfare because Islam teaches Heaven is under the shadows of the sword. And you fight. And if you are killed in the battle, then by the first drop of your blood, you will enter paradise and you become an intercessor for 70 members of your family. So Islam is not void of intercession. In fact, Islam argues that the reason they have a war with you is because you believe the blood of Jesus and his death intercedes for you. Islam says there's no one who can intercede. But oh, wait a minute. Well, the martyr can intercede all of a sudden. A sinner, a terrorist, a killer, a murderer now can intercede for you. When I read the Bible, things changed. But then when I talked to the BBC, just to continue the story here, the BBC... Uh, the first one wanted to comment about what I said, and he says, well, M Mr. Shubat, you know, it, it takes, regarding, I was talking about the Palestinian-Israeli issue, and he says, well, it takes two to tango. I said, it takes two to tango. I said, that's a myth. I love busting myth, so much myth. 
I said, that's a myth. It doesn't take two to tango. That's a lie. If it does take two to tango, there's usually a rapist and a rape victim. Sometimes the victim doesn't have anything to do with tango. If it does take two to tango, can you tell us what did the Jews do to tango in Nazi Germany? The second guy says, well, they must have done something. He didn't realize what he said. He realized later on he just shoved a boot in his mouth. I said, excuse me? Well, they must have done something. They always take you to tango. I said, what did they do? I want your audience here at the BBC. I want the English people to hear. What did they do to tango? So, well, uh, he kept silent. The third person wanted to help him realize what they'd just done. He says, but Mr. Shubat, I think the problem of today's world is fundamentalism. Fundamentalism has always been a problem in today's world. I said, I see where you're trying to switch gears, and I see where you're going with this thread. You think because now I've converted to Christianity from Islam, now that I've went from one extreme to the other. I said, look, I came on this plane, and I know in a plane ride, the person next to me is going to put that belt. The moment they put that belt, I know they're not going to go play outside basketball in midair. And I know I'm going to witness to them. And I do witness to them. And I know, and I confess, and I admit that I sometimes give people a headache. I said, but a Muslim fundamentalist, my friend, takes the whole head right off. I give them a headache. They take the whole head right off. What kind of moral equivalency are you trying to say? Instantly, he says, Mr. Shubat, they realized this guy is not somebody who they can just punch around. Mr. Shubat, thank you for stopping at the BBC. He says, I know what that means also. That means get the hell out. <laughs> Last time I was invited was uh, a year ago. That was when I first became Christian. 90, 90, I don't know. A long time ago. Man. I was invited to Oxford. Speak at Oxford University. And I spoke at Oxford, and I quoted Churchill, said Winston Churchill, what the problem is, and this and that. And they're making a choice in England that they want to establish Islamic laws. How many Americans know that in Great Britain, Muslims can go to their own court system? Only one, two, raise their hand. Three, four, five, six, oh, uh, much, much better. Pastor, you're doing your job. So Islam is not about religion, is it? Religion, yeah, it has religion in it. But what's this thing about establishing Islamic court systems? It's about changing set times and set laws. That verse came from the Bible, by the way. The devil wants to change set times and set laws. The Constitution has been set by the Almighty. That constitution has to change by any means. The devil wants to change the American constitution. Islam is a universalist religion. It has no respect for borders, and the end justifies the mean. Islam is a socialist religion. This is why the liberals support it. This is why Bloomberg supports the idea of building a mosque on ground zero. It's not because they're naive. No, in fact, those guys are not the naive. The naive is the church. The church is the one that doesn't understand what the heck is going on. Because the liberals sees a lot in common with Islam. Al Gore compliments Islam left, right, and center. Read his books. He hates the Bible. His whole problem is with the Bible. Their whole problem is because we are nationalistic as conservative Christians. Communism, Islamism, and every single Nazism, you name the ism, they all want universalism. One world government, one world order. American conservatism is very unique. There's nothing like it in the world. It's unique. God told us in the Bible that he changed different tribes and tongues. He made different languages in order to protect us. So God created America. So when Hitler go, eh, 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 eh. And so when somebody else, Japan, 
Noriega, Saddam Hussein. Who else? Anybody else with a lip? <laughs> and that's why God created America. You don't like being the cop? Live with it. Live with it. You've been chosen to be the police force of the world. End of story. And if you tell me nationalism is not biblical, go to the beginning of Genesis and tell me what that's all about. God is nationalistic. So if God is nationalistic, why are you not proud Americans? Being a proud American is biblical. And why do you think you say amen, amen? It's because God infused you, his will. He infused the peoples of the world to make them that way. In order so Lucifer can ever take control of the world because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I was down to the pastor yesterday. We weren't sure America, will it exist? Will it be destroyed? And we're back and forth arguing issues and, you know. And I don't think it's edifying to say that America will go down the drain. If you think America goes down the drain, I said, well, why is America has to go down the drain prophetically? Well, because it's not in the Bible. Papua New Guinea is not in the Bible, too. Does that mean it has to go down the drain, too? Mexico is not in the Bible. Sorry, Mexicans, you're gone. <laughs> Japan, Canada, Australia, they're not in the Bible. Well, they've got to be gone, too. Why only America has to be gone? I tend not to agree with that notion. It's not edifying. It's not even biblical in my view, but I could be wrong. When I read the Bible, 1993, when I began to argue with my wife, I said, Maria, it's time for you to become a good Muslim wife. Same thing my father did. It goes us down. Sin trickles down. I said, why should I leave my biblical heritage? She was Catholic, Mexican. She went to church. I remember I raised the kids to stone the statue of Mary in the back while we waited for her to go to church. And she would come out catching us, throwing rocks at Joseph and Mary and all that stuff. What are you doing to our children? I said, no, I'm just training them with the art of stone throwing. That's all. <laughs> True story. That's how it was. She didn't realize what she got herself into. You need to become Muslim. You need to stop going to church. Why should I leave my biblical heritage? That was her question. Because the Quran is, supersedes the Bible. The Bible has been corrupted. And I gave her the standard answers that my father gave to my mother. And my wife, Maria, she's smart. And she said, well, if the Bible has been changed, as you said, and the Trinity has been introduced into the Bible, perhaps you can show me those corruptions in the Bible. Point them out. Boy. So I can't point them out. So why not? Well, I've never really read the Bible. She goes, do you always make claims about a book you never read? She says, well, I'll find them. She says, go right ahead. Make my day. <laughs> so I bought a Bible, King James, New King James, for 10 bucks. With the plastic cover, opened it, began to read. Best 10 bucks money could ever buy. Besides the In-N-Out hamburgers, of course. <laughs> By the time I ended finishing reading the Bible, I wrote my first epistle. The book of Shubat, chapter 1, verse 1. The pastor is about to throw me out. Just take it easy. The verse 1 in the epistle of Shubat says, Man thought he was smart, but woman is smarter. When I read the Bible, I got right from the beginning of Genesis, and I will put enmity between you, the devil, and the woman. The woman. Why there is a war between the devil and the woman? This is why the Antichrist, it says he does not honor the desire of women. It doesn't say the Antichrist in Daniel 11 does not desire women. You took the, the out by no rights. Just to make an argument that it is homosexual. 
doesn't say that. It says he will not honor, neither will he honor the desire of women. And this didn't fit your Western thinking. And he said, well, I don't know what that means. So you kind of like made something else. He will not honor the desire of women. The spirit of Antichrist hates women. Does not honor their wants, their needs. All cults demean women. All. Mormonism demeaned women. You know, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, you know, they had concubines too, same as Islam. In fact, how many Americans know? Joseph Smith made his speech. I guess it's Brigham Young, Pastor was thinking, made the speech as it was in the days of Islam. It was Al-Quran and the sword, and today it shall be Joseph Smith and the sword. How many Americans know that? He wanted another Islam-like religion, and they had concubines when... Joseph Smith got done with his concubines. He would exchange his concubines with Brigham Young. You know, why do you think they called him Brigham Young? It takes a while for somebody to catch it. And I kept going on reading the Bible. Interesting when I got to Zechariah, chapter 14. Most amazing part of the Bible to me. Zechariah 14. In Zechariah 14, it's pretty clear. For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. To you, you read that, you keep going on. No, to me, I don't go on. If I just share one verse from the Bible, what I found and how sometimes it took me months to unlock things. Praying to God to show me the truth. I said, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I know you're there. Show me the truth. I'm comparing the two books. I want to convert my wife to the truth of Islam. Show me the truth. I just want to know the truth. I seek you with all my might, my heart, my everything. If you show me the truth, I will do your will in my life. That was the deal. I should have never added the last phrase. I will do your will in my life. Oh, my. You want me to do what? I what? All right, come up hither. Time for your martyrdom. Martyrdom? I'm not ready for martyrdom. May I reconsider? Those are the kind of talks I have with God these days. The house is rifled, the woman ravished. Ravished. That's what I learned in high school. How did God know what I learned in high school? They're supposed to ravish the Jewish women. In fact, if you just don't want to believe me, if you just don't want to believe me, go to my website. I can show you an Egyptian national television. That's the largest TV in the country, in the, in the Muslim world, in the Arab world. And you watch a psychologist coming out and saying to the Egyptians, we need to train our Egyptian males to rape Jewish women. Watch it. It's there. We need to train our male Egyptian men to rape Jewish women. This is the only way we can defeat Zionism. Rape them. The rape epidemic in Malmo, Sweden. The rape epidemic in Europe. The rape epidemic by Muslim males. It's horrendous. And then they go to the imams or the mosques. Hey, you know, we got some moral issues here with your kids. Well, cover your meat. If you leave meat in front of a cat, the cat's going to eat the meat. Cover the meat. In other words, women begin to dress up in hijab. Cover your flesh. Such was the responses from the so-called clergy. The houses will be rifled and the women ravished. And then God gets angry. It says in Zechariah that the feeble amongst Judah will fight like King David. The weakest in Judah at that time. When they see the horrific event, they will fight. As valiant as the fighting of King David, Melech David. How is that? I began to ask myself, wait a minute. I'm confused. How could the God of the Bible here, the wrong Bible, the wrong book, condemn it? And how could the true Allah condone it? Are you with me? God didn't give this logic for no reason. How could the true Allah 
condone such an act. It doesn't make sense. The lie is the truth, and the truth is a lie. This is why when I was on university campus, maybe, yeah, I'm a liar. Maybe through my lies, you'll see the truth. If you Google my name, well, it's Shubat. You'll see litany of attacks, accusations. He's a fraud. He's a liar. He never put a bomb in the bank. He was never a Christian. On the European media, when I used to go on, he was never a Christian, the Muslims will say. He was not even a Palestinian. He's a Lebanese phalangist. I must have been hit with amnesia and forgot who I was. And the Muslims came to remind me who really I was. And the media had to tell me the truth. Then you get in the liberal media, Mr. Shibat, if you're a confessed terrorist, if you, if you really were a terrorist, you know, you, you should belong in prison. I said, you're right. But why is it that you liberals want to imprison only the confessed terrorists and why you want to release the real terrorists in Gitmo? I learned when I read the Bible how to think like Jesus, how to answer questions like Jesus would, how to answer questions with questions. The challenges began when I began to share the Bible verses with people. I saw the hatred. You are lead, uh, you're reading self-fulfilled Bible prophecies. You know those Zionist Americans? They created the state of Israel so to make the Bible to become true. They fulfilled the Bible by their own action. God didn't do any miracles. The state of Israel is this and that. I said, really? Let me understand this. Because remember, I was reading Amos. I was reading Isaiah. I was reading in Amos chapter 9, verse 15. It says, and I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled out of that land. Impossible to uproot the state of Israel. How is that possible? We tried in 48, we tried in 73, Yom Kippur, you know. We tried terrorism, we tried Hezbollah and Gaza both rocketing at Israel. We could never succeed in uprooting that state because of a single verse in the Bible? Yes. But how is that? If it's self-fulfilled Bible prophecy, I began to ask questions. Jesus style. Jesus style questions are a little different. I said, well, wait a minute. The only reason the Jews established a state was because there was a major holocaust. Not just in, the, in Europe. The holocaust was always being worked also in the Muslim world. Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, was one of the, Hitler's best associates. He founded the Khanzar troops, the Bosnian, Albanian troops. Two di How many Americans know? Two divisions out of the eight divisions of the Nazi war machine were Muslim fundamentalists. Two. And they worshipped and prayed and bowed towards Mecca. And they killed and they burned thousands of churches. Killed hundreds of thousands of Christians. How many Americans know the massacres the Muslims did in Smyrna? One of the churches of the Bible. You know, you read the Bible, uh, the church of Smyrna, we say this to you. What happened to these churches? Ask yourselves. Who destroyed them? Where were they? Turkey. They were destroyed. You know, Smyrna was destroyed by the Turks in the early 1900s. An American ship was there. Military ship did not want to interfere because we don't want to interfere in a delicate peace process. How many were beheaded? Hundreds of thousands. I can show you the pictures of baskets of Christian heads. Tons of them. Blood as far as the eye can see. Heads floating in the water when the women ran to the, to the marina to try to ask for help. European ships, American ships. Help us! No one intervened. The ship couldn't get out of the dock because... The hair of the women, the heads tangled in the propellers. And no one speaks for them. What about the Armenians? What happened to them? They were raped. What about the Coptic Christians? Suffering in Egypt. I get on the Arab TV and they're talking about this Muslim who became Christian. Now she's being raped. Her kids are taken away from her. No one talks about those. Beheading. And you read the Bible, and, say, and I saw the martyrs that were beheaded in the name of Jesus. Even the beheading part is in the Bible. Shocking. And then you go on. And then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. God, Christ, will come down to fight those nations. 
How many Americans know even those nations that he fights are mentioned? In Isaiah 19, the Lord comes riding on a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter before him. When was the last time he had a Sunday school? Today we'll be discussing the Lord Jesus Christ, how he comes to fight the Muslim Egyptians. It doesn't happen. You think the liberals don't get it? You don't get it. And the rejection in the church is amazing. It's amazing. I get nine rejections out of one accepted request. Why? Well, we don't want to deal with Islam. Why? Is this how David dealt with Goliath? Is this how the 12 spies dealt with the Philistines? Ten of them cowered, two did not. You look at the numbers, you go, oh, I'm by myself. No, you're not the only Elijah. God raised 5,000 Elijahs. And God will work through the few, not the many. When did the Bible ever teach God's going to teach through the, the super duper church? How many seats can we get? And look what it says. Then the Lord will go forth and fight. He fights those nations. He names them. Isaiah 19, he fights Egypt. Habakkuk 3, the Lord comes to fight Midian. Isaiah 63, the Lord will come with his garment sprinkled with blood. He comes out of Edom. The Lord will come out of Edom with his garment sprinkled with blood. Ezekiel 25, and the Lord says in Ezekiel 25, I will stretch my arm against Edom. I, my arm? How many Americans know my arm is Christ? You don't believe me? Read Isaiah 53. You tell me what it means. Isaiah 53 is a suffering servant, the Messiah, Jesus. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To whom has the Messiah been revealed? And God's arm, the Messiah, will come to fight Edom in Ezekiel 25 and make it desolate from Teman. Dedan will fall by the sword. How many scholars would disagree? Dedan is Arabia. And in Habakkuk 3, he comes out of Arabia, out of Midian, fighting. And he goes to Egypt. He fights. Why he fights in Egypt? Even it tells you in Isaiah 19. The believers in Egypt, the Christians, the believers, will call for a Savior. And God will send them a Savior and a mighty one. Who is that mighty one? Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. It doesn't matter how you understand eschatology. They tell you the lie. It doesn't matter how you interpret. It does matter how you interpret eschatology. It matters a lot how you interpret eschatology. It matters a lot when the pastor says, no, I don't agree with you. And we have a big you know, argument over issues because we're both very careful. We want to make sure we're teaching the right thing. It's important. One of us is wrong. Iron sharpens iron. It matters. If it doesn't matter how you understand. Look at the first believers. Assume I was John the Baptist, and I came to speak to you. Jesus hasn't came yet. And I told you this. I said, the Messiah is coming to hang on a tree. And he is coming to Jerusalem next year, riding on a jackass. You will throw me out and stone me, because the Pharisees told you, no, he comes riding on a horse. He comes to defeat the Romans. He came not to defeat the Romans. He did not come riding a horse. He came, what Zechariah said, he comes riding on a donkey. And when he did come, all the people who believed in the horse interpretation, what happened to them? Went to hell. But wait a minute, Wally. They went to the temple. They sacrificed lambs and goats. Doesn't matter. God's not fair. No, he is fair. Because they did not seek the heart of God. They seek the heart of the Pharisee. They seek the books they read. They seek all these fanciful things they see. They make up their own Bible. He came on a donkey. He comes. He will deal with Islam too. Islam is not void from the Bible. In fact, that's why I believed in the Bible. I saw that all the countries mentioned literally by name, besides the argument over Gog, Magog being Russia, the countries that are literally mentioned by name in the Bible, the burden against Arabia, the burden against Damascus, you know, even the judgment of Christ in Joel 3. He comes because they divided the land. And he continues on. Go home. Continue Joel 3. What does he say? Who are you to deal with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia? You say, who's the coast of Philistia, Tyre and Sidon? You skip it. Don't skip it. 
entire Lebanon, Philistia, Gaza. Christ talks about Gaza and Lebanon when he comes. And what do we have in Gaza and Lebanon? Hezbollah, Hamas, throwing rockets at Israel. He calls them the prickling briars. You poked on me the whole time. It's amazing, the words of Christ in the Bible. What he says, the things he says, the whole Bible is prophetic. It's not one third, one quarter, the whole thing. How is the whole thing prophetic, Wally? He said, blessed are you when they persecute you. That's prophetic. If you, you know, carrying your cross is prophetic. Be as wise as serpent, as innocent as doves is prophetic. All of it is prophetic. The story of Moses parting the Red Sea is prophetic because here he parts the Mount of Olives. As Moses parts the Red Sea, Christ parts the Mount of Olives and the Israelites will run into the crevice and the, the Bible says the crevice will reach all the way to Azal. And they will hide in the crevice. As Moses protected his people, God sends Christ to protect his people. Even the story of Moses is prophetic. The story of Joseph, suffering Messiah. David, King Messiah. Elijah, conquering Messiah. When he comes to fight, all the things Elijah. And now all the things, you know, Gideon. Gideon, the story of Gideon. What is the story? Of, oh, we have so many hours, so many years to cover. And I have three minutes left. <laughs> because America is a country of wrap it up. Wrap it up. Cheeseburger, wrap it up. <laughs> and the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. As he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall split in two. Wow. Verse 3, the Lord will go forth and fight. God himself will fight. Verse 4, and in that day his feet. When did God have feet? When did God have feet? God hates rape. God is different. Verse 5, thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you we will be with him to come to combat in the battle of jerusalem the bible is serious the bible is interesting while we suffer for the cause of christ we suffer with joy to know that we're on the right track we know that that's the truth shocking even isaiah 63 i can't close I love the Bible. I can't help myself. You're going to have to peel me off the podium. <laughs> I hated Jews all my life. And when I read 63 of Isaiah, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments? He comes to fight in Edom, Muslim country. I have trodden the wine press alone. And then he continues on just to show you one verse in the Bible. Just one verse. What it means. It's shocking. Then he talks. Christ says in verse 8, for he said, surely they are my people. The Jews, they are my people. Children who will not lie. So he, God, became their savior. He became their savior. And in Isaiah 48, he even says he's triune. In Isaiah 48, Old Testament, before the time that it was, I was there. And now God and his spirit have sent me the son the trinity in one verse and then he says he became their savior he tells you how he saves them in verse 9 in all their affliction he was afflicted in every way the jews suffered god himself chose to suffer that's how he saved them how could he save them when they suffered with six million he paralleled how they suffered so if we see six million Jews in the footage, naked. And God chose himself also to be naked. No underwear, nothing. Naked. You saw it in the footage. As they suffered in silence, you'll never see a single footage with a Jew making a peep. They suffered in total silence. They went shot in the head into the pit. 
in total silence. And he suffered in total silence. He was silent in front of his accusers. He was mocked. He was beaten. He plucked his beard. You see the same things with the Jews in Nazism. Pluck their beards. Cut their things. Flog them. In prison. He was in prison. They were in the ghettos in prison by the millions. Walid, you're going too far with your biblical exegesis and your interpretations. We don't agree with you. How could you parallel the death of the Jews with Christ? I'm not paralleling it. The Bible is. Amen. Jesus rose on the third day. Are you saying Israel rose on the third day? Yes. When was the last time you read Hosea chapter 6? I could never find Jose in the Bible. <laughs> Any Mexicans could help me. Jose, Jose, there's Jose, hola Jose, chapter 6, look what it says, come let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us, he has stricken, but he will bind us up, verse 2, after two days, he will revive us, on the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live. In his sight. 2,000 years. A day is 1,000 years. 2,000 years Israel will return. And Christ will show up. And they will live in his sight. Yet they tell me we need to hate Jews because they're not Christian. Wait on God. God is in control. I am not in control. God is in control. Who am I to control God? Say they're not believers. I should hate them. We should dismantle the state of Israel. That's the devil. That's how you know the devil. Devil hates Jews. Devil hates women. You began to see. After two days, he would revive them. And he did. Then I was there. And I saw the six days war in my own very eyes. My mother was elated. She was very happy. My father asked her, why are you happy? We just went through a six days war. So ever wonder why early in the morning on the seventh day? You couldn't hear a single bullet in Jericho. We weren't in Jericho. Ever wonder what God said in the story of Joshua? He said, on the seventh day, early in the morning, God told the children of Israel to rise. On the dawn, before the seventh day commenced, and went around the walls of Jericho seven times, blew the shofars, and the Jericho wall trembled, and Israel was established as a state. He said, I see in my very own eyes, God is at work. That was my mother. My mother. And then I read Jeremiah, the prophet. The day is coming, says the Lord, that no longer will the children of Israel say that God who's brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but God who's brought the children of Israel out of the land of the north and out of all the lands where he has driven them. hundred different countries. God brought the Jews back. And in front of your very eyes, and you don't want to believe. You've got to be an idiot. God is an investment. And I'm from the Middle East. I like good investments too. So I invested in the God of Israel. And here I am. Don't forget to come tonight and bring your Bibles. If you forget to bring your Bibles, the males will be shot. I'm just kidding. God bless. We'll see you tonight. What time, Pastor? Six o'clock. Thank you very much. God bless.